All right, today we're gonna to talk about writing your IA. This is this huge lab that you're gonna write. And in a normal year, this accounts for 24% of your total IB score. So this is one quarter of the points that you're gonna to get towards that final you know, one through seven mark. Last year with the weird pandemic, this was 100% of people's score. And so I really ask that you take this seriously, that you invest a good amount of time in it. We're gonna write two complete IAs this year. That way we are prepped that no matter what happens in the future, what goes into IB is an amazing piece of work. In the past, if you didn't do so great on this, it wasn't that big of a deal, right? Because 75% was the external exam that you sat in May. And we can no longer assume that if you mess up this piece, that you'll be okay. That being said, 100% of the people in my class passed in the pandemic year. So I'm not overly concerned, I'm just saying take this seriously. This could be the difference between a four and a five or a five and a six. So make sure that you're following this instructions. I'm gonna briefly go over it, but you have all of these documents linked here um, in your Google Classroom where you can read them. At no point should any of this come as a surprise to you. I had a student last year from um, environmental science come back to me and say, well, I didn't know what the rubric looked like. Y'all have the rubric. So make sure that you are reading everything, that as you go, you're using that rubric and you're grading yourself. Do you have all of these parts? This is a huge portion of your class. So make sure you're paying attention. All right, this is essentially a research paper where you are doing your own experiment to prove or disprove a hypothesis that you come up with. The first IA that you're gonna do for me is on plants, but that's it, that's my direction to you. Find something that interests you about plants and do some research. So it could be something on germination, it could be something on, um, limited exclusion. So do certain plants exclude other plants from growing around them? It could be the use. So in my video um, about scientific method, I talked about the flies that are killing me in my backyard and the use of different plants. So something along those lines. This is anywhere you want to take it under the general purview of it's got to be with a plant. When you do a plant experiment, realize it takes a long time for a plant to grow. So you've got a month from the day I assign this to the day that it is due to do your experiment. Do not wait to the last minute to do this experiment because otherwise you won't be able to collect enough data. You need a good segment of data. I'm gonna say at least 10 days of recording data, not just one. Um, if this is something that could be an elementary school science fair project, don't do it because you will get knocked on that. If this is something that I could Google, hey, how do I measure salt water and plant growth? Oh my God, I've read so many salt water and germination. Please don't do that. But if I could Google that experiment and it comes up with a procedure, don't do it. Because if I can Google it and I can find that it's elementary, that it's easy, it's a canned lab that other teachers do, so can your IB grader. And if you do something like that, not only will your score be knocked, but if your paper goes in for moderation, all of your classmates' scores will be knocked. And trust me, they are not going to be friends with you if you're the reason why they lose points because you decide to take the easy way out and do an overly simplified experiment. You've got the time. Do real research, right? When you guys go to write your essays, here is where you can show, especially the UCs that want research-ready students, that you know how to do research right? You can use these experiments as examples of when have you ever taken the reins, taken an idea of your own, a question of your own, and done true scientific research. So it starts with a question. When you think about plants, what do you have a question about? What are you curious about? What are you interested in? And the first part of your formal lab write-up is this part right here, personal engagement. This is where you're gonna write a paragraph or two that is telling me and telling the IB grader why you chose the subject that you did, why you have a vested interest in experimenting the way that you did. 
this is also proving to them that I didn't just assign you something randomly, that you actually showed interest and forethought and you did your experiment. Um, you're going to include here some research, right? That you've done some reading on this topic, that you've got some background knowledge that, hey, you know what? You know biology. This is one of those areas that you can prove you have some biological knowledge. We want to make sure that you are versed in biology. This is the biology course. And so here is one of the places that you can prove it. When you do your formal um, lab report, note that I've got these segments bolded. Same thing. You want this title here, personal engagement, to be the first thing I see after your you know, name or title of your paper. And it's bolded, and then you write on it. This is going to help the grader, who's going to be some old crotchety woman sitting in her you know, house over summer, bitter that she's grading papers, help her find what she's looking for as she reads through to grade you and give you points. So personal engagement, why did you choose the topic that you did? What background knowledge do you have on this topic? Next part is your question. This is your question in its final form. Make sure that you include your IDV and your DV. Your IDV is the thing that you're manipulating and your DV is the data that you're collecting. Be specific in your question. For example, osmosis investigating the effect of solute concentration on the weight of potato discs when submerged in a range of concentrations of salt solution for two hours. That told me what my question was, what my thought process was, it, the subject essentially. It told me my IDV and it told me my DV and it even gave me some clue as to your experimental method, this whole submerged in salt water for two hours thing. So be very specific in your question. Then you're gonna write me your hypothesis. Guys, don't fall into the trap of thinking, I'm gonna do my whole experiment and then I'm gonna write my hypothesis so my hypothesis is correct. Your hypothesis doesn't have to be correct. This is science. We can get new data and we can say, oops, we were wrong. That's okay. And in fact, your conclusion is more interesting when your hypothesis is wrong than when you've proven yourself right. So your hypothesis is going to be written in the if, then, because. If I manipulate my variable, then I expect blank to happen because, and this because is huge, because again is showing that you've got biological knowledge, that you have based your hypothesis on some kind of research. If, then, because. You're going to make me this exact variable chart. Do not go off the trail and decide that you're gonna come up with your own format. Use this format. Your two main variables here, your IDV and your DV. Tell me what they are. Tell me the units that you are measuring them in. If it's something that doesn't have a measurement, um, you can put NA, non alkyl The range over here is after you've collected your data, what's the smallest number that you recorded on your data table and the largest number that you've recorded on your data table. Again, if it's something that doesn't have a range, put NA. Controlled variables are now things that you hold steady throughout your experiment. So all of your plants are exposed to the same temperature, to the same um, amount of precipitation, to the same climate. They're in the same size pots. They've got the same type of soil. Anything that you have done the same among all of your plants, this is a control. Just to reiterate, your IDV and your DV cannot be controlled. Everything else can. Make sure that even if it's like a no duh in your mind that you have controlled that, that you list it here on the controls. It's better to err on too many controls than not enough. Um, when you put it in, units if it's got units, NA if it doesn't. What do you think could happen if you didn't control this? If I didn't control the climate, what do you think effect on my experiment that could have? And then how are you going to eliminate that effect? How are you going to control it so that it's the same across the board? Your materials listed need to be in bullet form. Everything I need, if I were going to replicate your experiment, what are all of the pieces that I need to have? And then your procedure, again, in bullet form or numbered, um, short sentences. This is the actual steps that if I were to come in and I want to redo your experiment, how would I go about doing it? Again, don't assume that I know anything. 
If I were to say write instructions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you better tell me get the bread and the peanut butter out of the pantry and the jelly out of the refrigerator. Spread with a knife, a thin layer of peanut butter, right? Don't assume that I know how to do something. Again, you can never be too explanatory. Um, we need a photograph of your setup. So once you have everything set up, snap a picture and put this into your document. Um, annotate it, label it so I know all the parts. Again, this is one of those things where it's just proof that you actually did it, that you didn't just find this data online because you've got a picture of your plants in your backyard or on your patio. Your raw data is now the data that you are collecting on a daily basis. So set up a data table. Um, in this data table, don't tell me concentration A, concentration B, concentration C. Actually list it out with what it is. Don't make me go back into your procedure to try and figure out what these different concentrations are. Spell it out for me. Because what if I don't want to read your procedure, right? Um, you guys need a, what we call five by five when you do your experiment. So five different variances and five replicates of each. So what does that mean? If I'm doing solute concentration, I'm gonna have five different concentrations of the solute. And for each concentration, I'm gonna have five plants, five by five, which means I need 25 plants. Now you're thinking plants, oh my gosh, this is now getting expensive. Go buy a packet of seeds for a buck, right? Seeds are really inexpensive. Now, if you're gonna start with seed, obviously you have to start very early because the seeds have to germinate. Whereas if you're gonna start with a regular sized plant, then you can experiment a little quicker. Make sure that you include uncertainty here. So uncertainty is plus or minus the smallest increment on the device that you're measuring with. So if I'm doing temperature and my thermometer has um, just degree marks, my uncertainty would be plus or minus half a degree. So it's half of the smallest measurement on the tool that you are using to measure. And you just have to do it once at the top of each data table. Data processing, whatever raw data you have, you need to do some math. It could be as simple as taking averages, but really the reason why we do a five by five and get so many samples is so that you can do statistical analysis. I want you to try and get a standard of deviation out of this. The more stats you can do, the more kind of impressive this looks like, the better off you are. But if you can only do average, you can only do average and that's okay. Data presentation, you always have to have a graph. Here is where I'm gonna give you a little tip. You want your graph to tell a story because if I'm going to go read a real scientific paper, I'm gonna read the introduction, I'm gonna look at the data presentation, the graphs, and I'm gonna read the conclusion. I am probably not reading anything else in between. And so that graph has to tell the story of what happened. When you do this graph, don't graph your raw data. Graph your process data. Graph your averages, graph your means, graph your stats. Don't do the raw data. The raw data generally doesn't tell me much. And I wanna see trends. So if you measured something over 10 days, graph me the average growth over 10 days so that I can see the trend that's occurring. Here you might have two or three graphs. Your conclusion, you're going to revisit that hypothesis and then you're gonna utilize your data, the numbers, to tell me whether or not your hypothesis was true. Did the numbers say that, yeah, what I thought was gonna happen happened? Or do the numbers tell you that your hypothesis wasn't true, that they variated from it? And you're going to explain those numbers using science. Here is the second place that you are really gonna show me that you have learned something in science class, whether it be AP Bio last year, whether it be from my bio lectures, whether it be from the research you've done. In your conclusion, you are going to have to tell me why. Why did the numbers show me what you expected to show me? Why did the numbers deviate from what you expected? But why? The why is what's often missing in the conclusions. But here, prove to me that you have learned some biology during the course of the year. 
Your evaluation is a review of your procedures and your materials. It's possibly a place where you might explain some deviation. If you have your data and you have an outlier, two plants died, you're gonna toss them out of your data set, but then you're gonna come down to this evaluation and you're going to explain why those two plants are not in your data, why they died, why maybe your results were varied. Um, the year that I did this over summer last year, we had a freak monsoonal rainstorm, which like wreaked havoc on experiments that were being done outside. That information about that freak weather event went down into the evaluation. Like, hey, you know what? My results were possibly flawed because we had this freak monsoonal rainstorm. You can do this in graph form, and I gave you a graph here. Make sure that for every problem that you come up with a solution. This is not a place where you're gonna say you're a bad scientist, not a place where you're gonna say, I don't know how to use a ruler, I didn't measure accurately every time. Don't ever admit that you suck at science. This is more an in-depth, things out of my control that might have happened. Okay, that's it. Communication down here, this isn't anything you write. It's just saying that your lab has to be between 1,500 words and 2,250 words. It means that when I read your lab, I'm good reading it just once. I don't have to read a section two or three times to understand what you're saying. This means that your spelling is correct, that your word usage makes sense. This communication part, I highly recommend that when you're done with your lab, you give it to someone in class and have them read over it. Because communication is a stupid place to lose points, right? It's only two points in our rubric, but you want all of those two points. And you guys are all good enough writers that you can get those two points. Okay, I said I'm always gonna give you, uh-oh, let's see if we can get it. I'm always going to give you the, uh-oh, let's see here. The rubric, if I can get it. Let's pull that down, here we go. Um, this is the rubric from IB. This is what you're graded on. So the first one is personal engagement. You can get up to two points. Make sure that you hit all three things here. Exploration. This is now your um, hypothesis. This is your research question. This is your procedure and your methodology. Oh, this I need to point out here. You have to have some awareness of ethics and um, safety. So ethical, could your plants die? Yes, how are you gonna mitigate that? That you need just a section underneath your um, procedure that says um, safety or ethical awareness. And you type in there like, look, there's a chance of plant death, but it's going to be avoided by blank, 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 blank. The chemicals I'm using could be harmful if I were to ingest them. I'll make sure that I don't do that, right? So some awareness. If you don't put any statement of safety, even if your lab is benign and there's no harm that you could do, you need to have a line in there that says there are no ethical or safety considerations to be had with this lab. Again, even if there's nothing that could go wrong with your lab that could be harmful to you or your experimental things, you still need to have ethics and safety as a bolded feature underneath your procedure and you say there is no safety or ethical considerations to be had with this lab. You are acknowledging that you have paid attention to that. Um, people lose points all the time because they don't include that. Here is your analysis. Do you have enough raw data? Did you do five by five? Um, did you do some kind of math? Did you put that uncertainty there? People lose a point all the time because they don't have their uncertainties. Did you do graphs that make sense? And are they titled with the axes correct? Evaluation, do you have a good conclusion that refers back to the hypothesis that uses numbers to support yourself? Did you explain the why? And then did you um, have good discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of your labs and how to correct them? And then this is just that communication here. It wasn't easy to read. I've also given you this lab checklist um, so that as you go through, you can like check off that, yes, I'm doing what I need to do. 
as we go through, guys, please never hesitate to email me questions you have about, hey, does this question sound right? Um, to send me a procedure and say, can you look at this and see if it makes sense? To send me something to read and I'll give you feedback. I'm probably not gonna read your entire lab before it's due and give you feedback because I don't wanna grade it twice, but I'll read through sections if you're confused. We can set up Zoom meetings and have a discussion. Again, 25% of your lab in a normal year, 100% of the lab last year in the pandemic. So we wanna make sure we get this right. Okay, adios.